I want to welcome up Michael Evans from Defenders of Wildlife. Thanks, Tanya. Excited to be here. Um, yeah, so for those of you that aren't familiar with Defenders of Wildlife, we are a US-based national nonprofit, and we focus on the conservation of plants and animals and the ecosystems that they depend on, primarily in North America and, and largely in the US. And so Defenders has kind of typically done four different things. Um, the first is that we work with legislators to try to pass uh, more progressive or protective environmental laws, although these days it's mostly playing defense to stop terrible things from happening. Uh, we also sue government agencies. Are there any feds in the room? <laughs> no? Good. All right. <laughs> uh, we sue government agencies when we think that they're not uh, fulfilling their obligations under those laws. Um, we do have field teams, the third thing, uh, that work in local landscapes to implement kind of on-the-ground conservation projects, a lot of coexistence work. And then the fourth area is we work with um, those federal agencies to try to help them improve the ways that they implement uh, and enforce the conservation laws and policies that are on the books. So a caveat, this is, might be the least sexy talk about conservation and technology that you're going to hear, but it's in this like nitty gritty policy work that we really think um, there's an opportunity to pull some levers and actually see uh, positive impact for conservation. And so the group that I'm part of at Defenders, Center for Conservation Innovation, focuses on this fourth part, working with agencies, trying to give them better tools, trying to improve the analyses that they're using to inform the activities that they're doing. Uh, and so we have this catchy slogan, working at the intersection of science, tech, and policy um, to develop creative and pragmatic solutions. This is one of those types of uh, mantras that conservation organizations love to throw up there, but what does this actually mean? Um, I'm going to start with an example. And I'll, I'll go through a couple uh, over the course of my time here. So we uh, engaged in a partnership with the Nature Conservancy called the Long Island uh, Solar Roadmap. And what this is is in an effort to fulfill New York State's commitment to be 50% renewable energy uh, by 2030, I believe it is, Long Island is making a huge push to put utility scale solar um, across Long Island. And where we come in is we want to make sure that they're doing this in a way uh, that is not going to disturb a whole bunch of new habitat and native ecosystems. So how do we do that? Well, it turns out that uh, there's a lot of previously disturbed sites on Long Island. Here's a little snapshot of Nassau County. Uh, parking lots being the primary um, large area that you could throw big solar panels on that aren't going to clear a bunch of new habitat. So that raises the question, where are all the parking lots? It actually turns out that uh, OpenStreetMaps is kind of incomplete. Nobody has a good map. So we thought that we could employ this awesome synchronization between Earth Engine and TensorFlow to try to find all the parking lots on Long Island. Uh, and we're going to use this to try to guide a suite of local collaborators, uh, Long Island Power Authority, municipalities, to try to show them where they could put um, all these solar panels. And just as a, um, to clarify, we're doing all this with this sort of cloud storage to collab to TensorFlow workflow. Uh, the majority of these processes are free. We've actually been able to get quite a lot done in this without having to use a bunch of paid services, which has been awesome. And the reason that we think uh, we needed uh, TensorFlow and um, some of the AI approaches is because if you do like a regular classification to pick out impervious services, roads and parking lots look completely identical. Uh, and so it's really that spatial context that's important. So what we did was we trained uh, Deep Lab version 3, which at least when I started talking was one of the state-of-the-art um, computer vision models that may have changed in the past five minutes. And tried to, here's a little snippet of the output. Basically, when we combine what that uh, computer vision model was seeing with our classification approach, we were able to pull out all the parking lots and delineate those so that now uh, the decision makers can overlay this with uh, maps of like, um, social acceptance, uh, communities that are in need of uh, community-based solar, where existing power is, all sorts of things that you need to consider to guide the sustainable development. So we're really happy with this and, uh, and are excited about um, sort of future applications for this TensorFlow machine learning and, and Earth Engine marriage. All right, I promised this talk was going to be unsexy, and here comes that part, uh, the <laughs> least appealing title slide you're ever going to see. Um, as I mentioned, the, the majority of the work we do is trying to engage with federal agencies. 
Uh, and the reason for that is the US and other countries have a lot of really good conservation laws on the books, like the Endangered Species Act, for instance. And in our experience, the single biggest hole uh, or, or thing that's holding conservation back is inadequate monitoring and enforcement. Uh, agencies just don't have the personnel, time, or resources to monitor the thousands of uh, voluntary habitat conservation agreements that are on the books, um, the thousands of parcels of critical habitat, all these things that are great on paper, uh, and we just don't know what's going on there. So our approach to try to solve this problem has been fairly simple. We've developed a couple of algorithms to do uh, automated change detection, the thought being that if we can uh, rapidly and repeatedly figure out what's going on in the landscape, we can use that to help monitor some of these places. So uh, we're looking at a place in West Texas, and we just want to be able to do something like this, right? See a before and after image and automatically pick out what's changed. So a couple examples uh, just to sort of show how we've implemented this. Uh, the first is with the Dean sagebrush lizard. So this is a species that lives, unfortunately, in the heart of oil and gas country. All these little dots you see are well pads. Um, and because of this threat, the lizard was proposed for listing in 2015, ultimately declined because Texas came up with a voluntary conservation plan with the oil and gas companies uh, that they were going to mitigate so much habitat anyways. We were very skeptical of this, as you might imagine. <laughs> and so we basically turned uh, change detection to this area in West Texas where the lizard lives. And so here's, I think, three months separate images. And what we found is that not only were there oil and gas well pads, but these ginormous things called sand mines had started appearing in this region. Uh, so companies that were doing fracking had actually come in and just started basically wholesale dredging dune habitat to produce sand for their, uh, for their fracking operations. And so we basically presented this information to Texas and the Fish and Wildlife Service. Um, we're able to get the Texas Conservation Plan rewritten to try to encompass these sand mining activities. Ultimately where this went is the lizard has been uh, listed, um, or not, excuse me, not listed, petitioned for listing and is being considered by Fish and Wildlife Service to get protections under the ESA once again. Another very similar example um, is with the lesser prairie chicken. Uh, I believe we officially call them a charming bird. I might describe them as goofy looking. Um, among their more charming qualities is they are terrified of tall things like oil and gas uh, pumps and wind farms. And this is another case where uh, the species was listed on the, e in the endangered species list, was removed because a voluntary conservation plan was put in place by five states out in the southern Great Plains. Um, and this was supposed to mitigate habitat loss from some of these energy industries. Again, a reason for suspicion. Um, running change detection over the prairie chickens range out in uh, the western US, we found basically from the time it was delisted to the time that we did this study, there were eight new wind farms, uh, hundreds and hundreds of oil and gas well pads that didn't show up in the administrative records for those states. Um, and basically hundreds of thousands of acres of habitat had been removed. And it's not to say that nobody was monitoring this, but nobody had kind of taken a whole scale look at how the chicken's habitat was doing under this range-wide management plan. And so again, the story here is we were able to produce information for this species uh, that Fish and Wildlife Service used, and um, this one is a little bit further along than the sagebrush lizard. We got a positive 90-day finding on our listing petition, which basically means that uh, Fish and Wildlife Service thinks there's enough information to seriously consider and analyze whether the species should be put back on the endangered species list. So these were, uh, we were really excited and happy with, well, happy is the wrong word, um, pleased with the outcomes of these analyses, but, you know, we can only monitor so many places at once, and so we think the real promise and our priority is to democratize these change detection processes. Um, so most of our attention recently has been focused on developing tools that let the public run the same algorithms that we're using so that uh, other conservation organizations or ideally the federal agencies themselves can do these things. So the first tool we, we spun up was just a simple Earth Engine app that lets a user go in, select an area of interest, uh, say what habitat type it is, and then they run our change detection algorithms in the background and can see what has changed between whatever date they select. Um, so here we're looking at more oil and gas development. There's a theme to who the 
quote bad guys here, um, in, in Western Wyoming. And so this was exciting, uh, an exciting first step, but somebody still has to go in and actually kind of actively look or know where they're looking uh, and go in and do this again. So what we're most excited about is a collaboration with a group called SkyTruth that uh, helped start Global Fishing Watch. I think my colleague Christian is in the back there from SkyTruth. They have a platform out called uh, SkyTruth Alerts, which is really fantastic. It lets users sign up to monitor an area of interest and it will email uh, alerts to those users when some notification happens in that area. And so typically this has been um, you know, new permits or plans uh, that, that appear in those areas. But we, oh, there's no, there's no video. There's no access, um, yeah, you can get oh. Well, how about that? <laughs> gotcha. <laughs> yeah, let's try switching over to the house. All right, I'm not gonna mess with this. <laughs> <laughs> we can, we'll just, well, so go ahead. I can share the video uh, later, but this somewhat darkened out screen here um, kind of gives you a flavor of, of what's going on. So a user can sign up for to, to monitor an area of interest. In this case, we're looking at uh, Gulf County in Florida um, and the Panhandle. And basically, we run change detection in the background every month, aggregating all the Sentinel-2 imagery. And the user is sent an alert passively whenever something changes within that area that they signed up to monitor. So now, uh, we have a system where you don't have to continuously go back and check an area for changes. You get alerted when it happens. And so what we are working with SkyTruth and uh, have meetings with the Fish and Wildlife Service tomorrow is uh, to try and get agencies to potentially adopt this tool uh, as a way to monitor, like I said, the thousands of conservation agreements, um, different, yeah, mitigation uh, areas, all the, all the different nuts and bolts of how the Endangered Species Act and other federal laws are implemented, uh, and be able to basically keep better tabs on the conservation laws that we have in place. So we're very excited about this. Um, we are about to, I think, open it up for beta testing. We're, we're looking for <laughs> feedback from any users that are interested uh, so we can continuously improve the algorithms. Um, our next step are to potentially incorporate some of those TensorFlow workflows that I mentioned at the beginning uh, of the talk to see if that can improve our precision with change detection. Um, and yeah, we're thinking about ways that we can scale this up. So I'll be interested to talk to some of the other folks who have had success um, building their tools up to, to serve to ideally hundreds and thousands of users. So with that, thank you everybody. I guess thank you. some questions. Any questions for Michael? Hey, is it on? Okay, so um, you mentioned there's, I think you said thousands of these voluntary conservation districts. Is there a master database of all those polygons? <laughs> <laughs> no. Uh, they exist in a scattering of maybe PDFs in a bunch of different Fish and Wildlife Service offices. PDFs? Yeah. There's, there's a lot of very basic technical hurdles uh, to, to cover before we can use some of these tools. Um, and I think that's one of the points that I, I want to try to communicate when I talk about this work is, at least in our world and the groups that we're working with, um, they're extremely well-intentioned, but it's sort of a situation where if you build it, they won't come. Like, the data and the infrastructure in many of these agencies is just not there, not centralized, not standardized. So there's, there's a lot of kind of, uh, but they want to do the right thing generally, so there's a lot of kind of hand-holding and prodding that has to happen. Um, and so simple tools, I think, are really what we need to, to focus on pulling ahead. I have a, a follow-up question to the build it and coming. Um, what's, can you say, like, uh, what's the handoff from when you build a tool to uh, some kind of decision being made? Like, are, are the people who are doing 
like at what point does it turn into legislation or listing or anything like that? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, so the listing decision process is a little more well-worn. There's a standard set of procedures in terms of submitting a petition with information. Um, so that one's relatively easy to follow. The relationship that we're still kind of working out is how to get agencies to adopt some of these things. So one model that has worked is we build something, we show them that thing over and over again, and eventually they do it themselves. <laughs> um, we've had this happen with uh, online recovery plan approach that without going into details, they basically copied what we made and that's great from our perspective. Um, yeah, when you're working with the federal government, there is sort of an institutional barrier. We, we need to get an official agreement on the books with that agency. I think that's what we're still trying to, to figure out. I don't know if that answers your question. But Okay, cool. Thank you. Um, thanks again. <laughs>